I talk and 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 I say something only um, I can't say it when I'm stuck. My name is Joshua Ford, I'm a presenter and I've had a stammer for as long as I can remember. Contrary to popular belief, a stammer and a stutter are not the same thing. A stutter is an involuntary repetition of one letter while a stammer is any speech slowing defect. The exact cause of stammering is unknown, however, it is believed to be the result of the parts of the brain involved in speech being wired differently. Stammering is quite common in young children with 1 in 20 experiencing a phase of non-fluent speech. While it's estimated that 1 in every 100 adults has a stammer and it's more likely to persist in males than females. In most cases, stammering will resolve over time without treatment, but for those that don't, speech and language therapy can improve fluency and communication skills. Over the course of this series, we will be speaking with young people who suffer with a stammer about their experiences, finding out how it can affect employment and what can be done to help. I was keen on finding other people who also had the speech impediment to find out just how much their journey differed from mine. But to do that, I'd need to speak to the people who knew stammerers better than anyone else. So I contacted the Michael Palin Centre. The Michael Palin Centre offers a specialist service to children and young people who stammer from all over the UK. They provide speech therapy not to eradicate the stammer, but to help the sufferer live with it and find new ways to lessen the effects. So I've just got an email back from the Michael Palin Centre. Uh, what did it say? So they're doing a two week course, intensive course for young people who stammer and would like us to come along and speak with them. And how do you feel about that? Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little nervous. Like, I went in for speech therapy when I was a kid, so it's gonna be really weird going back. Mm. But I'm looking forward to it, it should be good. So you just like to start by just telling me a little bit about yourself, how old you are, um, what you do in your spare time, and how long have you had a stammer? Okay, so uh, I'm 17. I've had a stammer for as long as I can. Remember, really? Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm just like a, a, a regular person. I'm um, at. I'm, College now, plan to go to university next year, and my main interests are just um, watching and playing sports. Really, I'm my own uncle. I had this stamina since I was four years of an age. I have been um, on a lot of speech course courses but when I found the Mile Pay or Pay Centre um, it um, helps 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 me me um, more. I have had my stammer for about t t t t t t ten years now. Um, it started at the age of eight. Um, I'm about to go to uni okay. so I'm in, I'm about to go to year 13 in September and um, I'm doing four A-levels so <laughs> I'm doing psychology, sociology, drama, philosophy and ethics and <laughs> hoping to be an adult nurse in the, in the university. I'm 16 years old, I'm from London Enfield, um, yeah and um, yeah, in the future I'm going to be looking to pursue my music career in rap music and maybe actually house music and things like that. Um, yeah, right now I'm um, starting to practice it with um, uh, uh, um, kind of like things like going to studios that I know and probably like, probably like um, Probably having them practice with it. So, you so say you've had a stammer for as long as you've been yeah. but what kind of, so from an early age, yeah. what kind of support do you feel like you received any from like schools and things like that? Well, the first support I can remember is going to um, a local speech therapy centre close to where I live. That probably started when I was about 
seven or so. And then um, I, I, I did have a small bit in school, but not much. Then when I was about eight, nine, the, um, the speech therapy uh, person close to where I live um, told, told me uh, about the Michael Payton Centre. Um, then I ended up doing a two week intensive course there in around 2008, um, which really did help my fluency and for about two years uh, I was fine. Then about two years ago I started to go down a bit and I started to come back to one-off sessions here and, and that just led me to now think on this course. In um, our family, there has hasn't been no one that had a stammer um, as as we know of. But um, I I had to bought a lot of speech therapy at school and that. But it seems seems like with the speech therapy I had at school, it seemed like they were trying trying to get. Rid, rid of your stamina, mm. but hit bar at the Michael Palin Centre. It um, seems they want want um, you you to have a stamp, but to a set you have a stamina, and what helps helps um, you. I didn't have any support until 2011, where um, a teacher in my secondary school. Um, I, I went to the reception one day and I was asking for um, like a plaster or something like that because I injured myself and the teachers kind of just asked me that are you okay and I was just like yeah I'm fine and she was like are you nervous or something and I was like no I, I just have a speech impediment and then she was like are you getting any help and I was just like what do you mean what type of like help I mean like at the age of eight, I haven't got any help. So what do you mean? Like, is there some type of help? And then she kind of referred me on to like the Hackney Learning Trust. From then, I have had been having a regular speech therapist in my school. Up to till this day, I've actually been having it. They even referred me to the Michael Palin Centre as well. Yeah. Um, and from at, um, from primary school, because it was such a traumatic experience, having like being the only one in school who like like talks like this and having a tama, so I didn't talk at all. I was in a shell. I was really really shy actually, really really shy. I didn't want to speak. I was scared that if I do that, someone would attack me or something like that. So just having like this. Having a speech therapist really, really helped build my confidence up, and I'm able to do a lot of things now. Like I've like applied for like prefects, senior prefects. I take part in like NCS, like helping mental people, helping mental year six people transitioning into year seven. Because I know that I didn't have that help, and especially being a young child who have a stammer, just going into a new environment with like thousands of other people so I just want to make like a, a, a difference in other people's life. I started uh, uh, in like year four having some um, help with it from some um, yeah from, from speech therapists but it didn't really help me that much it didn't really do that much for me so I still had it throughout primary and then I and then uh, yeah it caused me uh, quite a lot of drama in primary uh, because I was quite nervous with it uh, there were a lot of teachers that didn't help a lot with it, and um, yeah, and then uh, uh, yeah, and then yeah, that's kind of it really with it. So when you refer to the speech therapist, who was it that referred you? Was it the school? Or uh, it? Yeah, it was a school with that um, brought someone in from some place. I'm not, I'm not sure where it was. 
yeah. Well, that's especially for you. Fun. Yeah, especially for me, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it didn't really help that much, but it was just something that to get, I was probably like getting understanding of it. <clears throat> okay. Really. So was it a case where they've tried to get you to, they teach you how to deal with it, or was it more of a case that they taught you more um, how to try and get rid of it? I can't really remember, but the things I can remember was they would uh, throw that, uh, like, uh, for example, like they would show me a picture and I had to name the picture, even though if it was a hard word, I couldn't change it, I had to just say what it was mm. and see, uh, and then it probably gave them understanding of how, uh, but probably, probably like how I said it mm. to them. Yeah, it didn't help me that much, but it was, yeah, it was all right though. No, fair enough. <laughs> so what kind of support do you feel like you received from like family and friends? Well, I've been uh, quite lucky in that I've heard people, uh, other people like at the course have said that people bully them at school, but personally, uh, I, I haven't ever, uh, um, I had that, and I've always had, always had quite supportive people close to me, and I and and these people were just instead of like when I'm stammering, instead of just blurting in, which sometimes they think is they think is helpful. Um, most people are like no, they um, and I think that the best course of action is to just be, is to be patient and just and just to just to wait, um, wait till I finish. What I'm trying to say. Um, now, um, yeah, my family and friends, they are really help, helpful. They give me time to speak and that. Um, yeah, and uh, they say, um, take um, your time, don't um, be so hard, hard on, on yourself. So, help. Is that something that helps you? Yeah, and um, Kung Fu helped, um, helped me too because when I was younger I, 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 had, um, I was always angry because of my speech and that and Kung Fu helped, helped me, or me with that to control my um, ang anger and my speech too and I found it's very odd to say Kung Fu helped my speech too for some re reason, so. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that's because Kung Fu kind of gave you comfort, confidence and it helped you channel the anger? Yeah. And it helped you deal with, yeah? yeah. Even like a family, they didn't know how to react to it. So they kind of teased me about it, hoping that like the teasing would help me, um, probably help me start talking normally again but it really didn't help so it just kind of went on for there through family it's been great i mean it, 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 um yeah it's always been comfortable with my family to talk about and yeah uh, but with friends i tend to keep on a low with them because i don't want that many people knowing outside i'd rather just keep it to myself or keep it to my family but yeah well, probably like that through school and through primary and secondary, they kind of knew anyway because they would obviously see it in classroom. So, yeah. So, when you're speaking to someone, say me, you're speaking now, what's the best thing that I could do to help support you? Be patient in, and, and just wait for them to um, let the person who stammers. finish what they're trying to say and be so and be so supportive of, of the person. I think give give me time time to 
speak and um, um, it's um, very, very hard to say you don't uh, pull a face mm. face or not but um, yeah as, as, as you are now yeah give uh, give me time time and um, now, now to speak and I allow um, me, me to calm down a bit because I seem like when I'm quite Nervous or not, it sort of comes um, out out um quite um bad um labor, but it's when I calm on, I'm fine. I feel like, well, to help me is just to just listen. Like even though I might take a longer time to say what I want to say, just having someone just listen really encourages me and knows that like the person is actually listening to what I'm trying to say not just like looking away like if, like if I'm talking to someone and they look away I just know that oh like the person might have lost interest or are they uncomfortable with the way I can speak so just having someone listen to me really helps me like keep on mm. g g g going and talking as well and not like feeling like I'm making the other person comfortable because I do a thing a lot which is mind reading and I try to figure out what the other person is thinking of like how I'm speaking and if I feel like the person is feeling quite uncomfortable kind of just <laughs> stop talking or I just like make sure like I, f I end the conversation really really quickly it helps when uh, uh, it probably helps when there's a lot of eye contact on me because I feel I can communicate better um, if I see the person's interested then I find it easier uh, if the person's smiling uh, or just taking notice really okay so, what's the worst thing worst thing someone probably not giving me time or someone trying to rush me so if someone's like hurry up or things like that I get kind of nervous and things yeah right. Meeting the young people truly was a humbling experience, but what was playing on my mind was how schools played a part in the development of these young people. Some received speech therapy that was geared more towards getting rid of their stammer than actually dealing with it, while others only received therapy when they got well into secondary school. I needed to find out what was going on. After weeks of contacting schools with no success, I wanted to find out from other stammerers if their stammer impacted on their careers, so I spoke to Warren Nestleford. Warren is a presenter and news reporter for Five News who has had a stammer from an early age. Let's see what he has to say. I've always had a problem with speaking too quickly, and that was a big, big problem when I was younger to a greater degree, and I had a bit of a stammer as well, which would mean that I'd trip over words or couldn't say words or it was very difficult to get my words out um, and that was right from a young age. Was it something you still feel like you suffer with? Uh, not so much. I think um, sometimes I speak um, too quickly still and I've kind of got around that to a degree um, but um, I'd say for the most part my stammer's kind of gone now um, but there are certain techniques, I mean there are, there are certain periods where maybe I, I don't um, I, t I don't say certain words because I know I'll trip up over it or I'll stammer over it. So I've kind of worked away in my mind to kind of yeah. stop that from happening. So what kind of support do you feel like you've received from like when you first started stammering? Um, did you receive any support kind of from like a professional body or anything like that? Not really. I mean, I used to go to um, like a, a reading club or like a, a school club at my local library. So I grew up in Dudley in the West Midlands near Birmingham, oh, okay. a small town. And when I was there on a Saturday morning, there was a teacher there uh, and she was, she, I don't know, she was quite old school, a um, bit posh maybe, you could describe her as. And she kind of helped me with a few kind of um, techniques to enable me to slow down and to um, just to take a breath and to pause and not to rush. And that helped me. Cool. And do you feel like if having a stammer impacts on your, you're obviously a newsreader, do you feel like it impacts on your job, your life, in any way whatsoever? Uh, well, like my, my voice, my, you know, presenting or reporting, it's, you know, central to what I do. So arguably you could say that I've overcome it because I'm doing a job where I'm reporting or presenting on national news when maybe people wouldn't notice it most of the time anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I've got over it for the most part. There are still kind of times when 
if you're in a big group or you're having a conversation and you're getting a bit excited and suddenly you you can't say the words you want to say or you get a bit trapped to a degree I suppose yeah. and that still happens sometimes yeah. but like um, it's one of those things isn't it Warren's attitude was admirable but that doesn't mean that everyone has had the same journey I caught up with a journalist colleague of mine named Ollie to share his experiences I think the first time I remember having a stammer was when I moved to Dublin when I was four years old around four between the ages of like four and six I think I I think it might have been a move or something I'm not sure what how I was saying but yeah but since I was four um, and then it got a bit worse when I um, as I got a little older and then began to notice it more, it became more of a problem when I was about, I don't know, nine or ten. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and that's when I spoke to my mom about it, spoke to people about it. I was like, how can I combat it, basically, yeah. So what kind of support did they give you? Uh, I went to a speech therapist okay. when I was like about ten. Yeah. Um, for two years in Ireland and then for a couple of years in Croatia as well. Um, just like, we, it was weird. It was like, in Ireland, it was a lot of like, they taught me like techniques, like breathing techniques, relaxation mm -hmm. techniques. Um, we had like polka dots on my telephone, on the door to like remind me to like use them and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then it, that continued in Croatia and then I stopped speech therapy when I was about, I don't know, 15, I think, about 15. Mm. And then from then on, just been dealing it, with it in my own way. It's not, it's, it's not been such a problem in the last few years, I would say. Yeah. Um, I'm more comfortable with it, uh, which in itself has meant that it's also less, it happens less of the time. And do you feel like in any way it impacts you in everyday life, for example, using the telephone and things like that? Yeah, well, yeah, I've always been, even to this day, I think it's like, it's still with me, like I still don't like talking on the telephone. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way, but yeah, I really do. <laughs> I hate it, yeah. Yeah, I hate talking on the telephone. And um, it's, it was kind of, it didn't, def I try to make it, try to like avoid it from defining me but um, it did shape me a lot like I got into you know writing and you know, I tried to because I'd avoid you know answering questions in class or you know raising my hand at points even at university and stuff um, but I kind of threw myself into like writing which in a way has led me to journalism, I'd say. Um, also just like, made me more, it's, I always like, felt it was like a curse, but I think it's been, it's strengthened me in a way, I think. I think resilience in terms of stuff and just powering through stuff and, and just being more aware of like, all the little problems people kind of have about like talking about them and stuff. Do you think it has any impact on your career? You're having a stammer, do you think it's going to um, kind of, do you think it's detrimental to your career? Do you think it's something that can help you? Um, a bit of both, really. I think people that don't know about uh, stammers or stutters and stuff, they look at you as an idiot, basically. Like, you know, you can't speak. Or like there's something wrong with you, um, and I always feared that kind of that prejudice in a way, um, and I feel it's helped me in terms of just being more like what the hell of it, like being like more risk taking, more, like brave in terms of situations and approaching them. Um, 
Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're gonna get out of the rain. Yeah. <laughs> it's great to see that the people we spoke with aren't letting having a stammer hinder them in any way. But I needed some real answers about stammering, so I decided to speak to a professional. Elaine Kelman is a speech therapist and the head of the Michael Palin Center. She told us what the Michael Palin Center does to help stammerers. At the Michael Palin Center, how do you help people, especially young people, deal with stammers? Well, we take children from all over the country and we take them from as young as two right up to adults. Um, but a lot of our work is focused with children. And because we have 12 therapists here who all specialize in stammering, it's great because quite a lot of speech and language therapists don't quite know what to do with stammering. It's a complicated problem and some children just don't seem to be getting better. So they get sent to us and it's great because then we can all focus on the stammering and seeing what we can do to help them. So they come in and we do quite a detailed assessment because what we know is that each individual that comes here is going to be really different from mm. the next one and it's really important that we find out what that individual's like okay. um, so that we can work out what they need to help them mm -hmm. um, and the therapy that we do some of it we do on a one-to-one -one, if that's what they want mm -hmm. and need but we also run groups which is a really nice way of doing therapy because quite a lot of people who stammer don't know anyone else with the same problem yeah. and it's really nice for them to be in a group where they just feel like one of them the rest yeah, yeah, yeah it's normal. just a normal yeah. thing to do there's no big deal about it no one's gonna laugh at you and people understand how you feel okay. so the group therapy Therapy programs great we sometimes do those in a two week sort of scrunched up like a, almost like a boot camp type yeah. thing but what's really important with those is that we want to see that they can keep it going because you can learn anything in two weeks yeah, but keeping it going beyond that mm -hmm. is, is really important yeah. so that's why we bring them back in um, once every mm, couple of months or something like that and keep okay. in touch with them to support them so how are they normally referred to you they can refer themselves if they want to they can just get in touch with us and say I want to come or the doctor can refer them or the teachers at school parents mm -hmm. um, if they see a speech and language therapist they can refer them to so basically any way they want to um, so how important would you say it is to catch it as early as possible catch the stammer as early as possible okay yeah it's great if we do get stammering right near at the beginning of when it starts then often it's a little easier to treat because what happens with stammering it's a physical thing it's it's because of what's going on in your brain and the wiring in your brain so that's why you start to stammer but what happens quite quickly with stammering is that people get anxious about it or they get embarrassed about their speaking and when those sorts of things happen you've got to treat that stuff as well yeah. so when we get them when they're very little sort of under five the preschool children mm -hmm. we can do some relatively little therapy and a lot of them it completely resolves and the older they get especially if it's really having a big impact on them then we have to do more therapy and often this intensive therapy because they need you know more help at that stage okay um, judging from some of the, what people were saying some of the young people they were mm -hmm. saying that the schools kind of would try to, at an early age, they were trying to get them to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Do you think schools could do more to kind of help um, with, you know, speech therapy themselves? Mm. It's difficult in school because a lot of the time children who stammer, they want to keep a low profile actually, you know, they want to be below the radar so that they won't put their hand up to answer a question just in case they stammer, they won't volunteer for a part of the play or, you know, doing a presentation or something like that. So a lot of teachers don't even know they've got children who stammer in their class and it's amazing for us when we think what we can do to help teachers think, yeah, maybe that one's quiet because he stammers, not yeah. because he's just a quiet person, he's actually got a lot to say, but he's really kind of hiding his light under a bushel there yeah. by, you know, keeping very quiet. So teachers could help by sort of seeing what's going on for a child. The other thing that teachers can do to help would be to really think about how they respond to the child who stammers. And a lot of people don't quite know what to do. They think, ooh, should I finish it off for him? You know, should I yeah. help him out? And teachers feel the same, you know, and they're not sure. The best thing you can do is to say to the child themselves, what would you like me to do mm -hmm. when you're struggling? But the rule of thumb generally is 
don't try and help them. If you just wait, yeah. they'll get there in the yeah. end. They'd rather you didn't try and guess because if you get that wrong, that's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. So teachers can help out in that way too. And I don't think schools most schools don't have a lot of speech therapy and stuff like that on site but I think if teachers can give the pupil a bit of support and really looking out for bullying and teasing because yeah. that is a big problem for it children is, who stammer. Definitely is. I've experienced that myself and it's quite, Have you? Yeah, yeah. It's quite bad. No it is bad and for some reason stammering something that people say is funny you know you you people laugh at in films and stuff at stammering you wouldn't laugh at a blind person or a person no. you know with other disabilities mm. but stammering somehow they think it's okay to to laugh and schools can really I think crap crack it crack down on mm. uh, any kind of teasing any kind of bullying really looking out for it because that is it can be a complete nightmare for some of the children that come here definitely yeah. so would it be fair to say that as well as teachers um, being more interactive with the pupil mm. the, they could also be getting more training to obviously be able to spot the signs of a stam someone who stammers and then be able to know what to do more so than kind of Better guessing game essentially. Absolutely. I think the more teachers understand about stammering, and when the film came out, The King's Speech, people got a bit more understanding at that point that it was, you know, because for some teachers they think, well, how come one minute he's okay and the next minute he's stammering? Is he putting it on? Mm -hmm. Which of course he's not. Um, and they don't get the kind of turmoil and torment that people are going through yeah. when they're trying to say something. Mm -hmm.